Well, good morning. I want to thank the round table and I want to thank um, Melissa because I think these are building so nicely on one another. So um, I'm very excited about that. Um, I too changed my title. Um, facilitating informed decision making during the consent process, strategies for increasing minority participation in clinical trials. And I'm not going to focus here on, you know, what is a well documented um, underrepresentation of minorities in research, not just clinical trials, but in research. We know that. But I want to talk further and using material developed by um, myself and our team. Talk further about, you know, what did we learn when talking to researchers? What did we learn in doing a national survey of African Americans and Latinos? And then how did we use that to develop some potential guidelines, some of which are going to echo things you've heard, and a tool for educating the public about research? So I'm going to start here and um, with a comparison of research and community members' preferences for inform, the informed consent process. And then I'm going to talk about and show you a model we developed for education of the community to help increase informed decision makers. Now here's the context, right? How many of you have ever heard somebody say, I'm going to consent the subject? I was going to say, if I don't see more hands go up, I don't think you're being honest. Um, consent the patient. I'm going to do an act to you, right? So that context is critically important. If it's research or if you're a patient, we're talking about, we talked already about vulnerability and the power differentials. You're, you're, you're naked, as, as Jeremy says. You're vulnerable. You're sick. But maybe it's a research study. You're not naked. You're not vulnerable, and you're, or, and you're not sick. But maybe you are a racial and ethnic minority facing a white-coated doctor who may also be white, who has a lot more education. You may have a lot less education. There are a whole array of things that make that context critically important. And we also know that increasingly, for racial and ethnic minorities, some of our own data, but not only our data, others did, um, show that while minorities are increasingly willing to participate in research, but they are still not. So how can we look at informed consent to help address that? It's a conversation and it's a document. And a huge proportion of our, of our focus is on the document, as we've talked about some. So I want to talk about that process of the conversation and a little bit about the document as well. We know some of this already. Poor recall and understanding of information that was conveyed during the informed consent process. And overall, particularly with racial and ethnic minorities, lower level of knowledge about research and research terms, and certainly and. Um, we just heard a little bit about some of the potential for misunderstanding and distrust. And some of that can be in, improved upon during the consent process, or that mistrust can be reinforced during the consent process. So how can we improve this? And so what we did was to, um, we had a NIH grand opportunity Bioethics Research Infrastructure Initiative grant. In that grant, we did, did data collection with researchers, with IRB members, and then we did a national study of just African Americans and Latinos. And so I'm going to share some of that. We looked at the literature to guide our survey development, and we also mirrored some items on both those surveys. So the researcher survey, and, and we, we um, publicized this. This was an online survey. It went out to members of, of Primer, Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research, and, and out in a number of ways. So just a little bit about this. Um, they were researchers with at least 14 years. Some of them were IRB members, research staff, um, and then largely white, um, smaller minority participation. 
Our national phone survey was a random sample, just African Americans and Latinos. So you can see here, so um, largely women, not surprisingly, um, about 45% Latinos, 56% had a college degree, um, and you can see some of these other health data, but some representation also across income levels. So we asked questions to researchers, and we asked similarly as sort of the converse of that to the community. What methods do you use during the informed consent process? We asked community members, how would you like to learn about it? What strategies do you use to increase understanding? And what methods might be helpful for you in understanding the, the informed consent document? And then sort of the kind of flip side, we asked about um, how do researchers assess understanding? And what just generally do members of the public know about research terms and the purpose of informed consent? So let's do the research terms first. And so what you see here is that what we know from the literature is there poor recall from, of information and that minorities often have a lower level of knowledge. And so what we see here is about three quarters or two thirds of community respondents understood confidentiality and anonymity, but it continues to go down from there. And I didn't, we don't have an exhausted list of terms, but you can see that in terms of understanding not research and the words they're likely to encounter that we have some work yet to do. So, then let's talk about what we saw. So we asked researchers what they used to inform participants, potential participants. And so the top two were these, taking information home in a one-on-one -on -one discussion. You see multiple meetings, group discussions, very little media, as Linda was talking about. Having a friend or family present was, was used by about 60%. Reading the consent form to the participant was used by just over 60. And then um, very little use of interactive technology. Now let's see what community members, African Americans and Latinos, said would be most helpful to them. So, uh, you know, fairly good agreement on taking information home, one-on-one -on -one discussion, but now let's see what happens. They wanted more meetings. They wanted more opportunities to talk about this. They definitely wanted to talk with participants. They wanted some group discussion with others and with participants. They saw videos as potentially helpful. Family and friends present less so. Definitely having the consent form read was not seen as particularly helpful and some interactive technology or games. So we have some disconnect here before the practices used by researchers and the preferences of community members. So let's look at the format now and so some of, of how this was delivered. So researchers said over 97% said we use plain language. How many of us believe that's really true? but they do. Um, some use a very small percentage use a summary at the end, a few use pictures, large print, and about four, a little over 40% did questions and answers at the end of sections. Now let's see what community members said might be helpful to them. Plain language, definitely. A summary at the end of sections. So these are complex documents as we've talked about. Pictures, so what, what Jeremy was describing that they've used in Malawi is coming into play here. Large print, you know, probably people answer that are the people that need the larger print. And questions and answers. So we know that, that informed consents are written at a much higher grade level and, and I always say my, my parents had high school diplomas so could my parents understand it? I look at some of these documents, I don't understand them. And so we're seeing some of this, you know, disconnect happening here. So we've got some discrepancies between what researchers use 
and what community preferences are. And, you know, what we see here is the first two that are used by the researchers, you know, in summary, are not as critical to the community. Whereas, you know, the community would like more than one meeting, they'd like to talk with study participants, and the researchers use a different set of techniques. So we also looked at the literature. And so the literature says what's most effective, effective face-to-face interactions, extended conversations, teach back, plain language, less effective as Linda had talked about many of these things. So we saw here the community preferences on the left, the literature on the right. Community members really many of their preferences coincide with what the literature says are the most effective means. So there they are. One-on-one, -on -one, multiple meetings, talk with study participants, plain language. Then we asked what researchers do to assess understanding. And so what we see here is about 52% open-ended questions, 51% sign an initial every page, which is not seen anywhere as an effective means to assess understanding, teach backs, an independent monitor, patients complete a questionnaire, so some sort of questionnaire afterwards to see if they understood. What was most shocking to us is 32% reported none. They did nothing to assess understanding of the potential participant at the end of the conform, informed consent process. So that's a bit disturbing to us. So what do we know? Participants, we know, may have incomplete comprehension of information that they've received during the process. We know that there are discrepancies between how researchers and how community members may want this to, to take place. And we know that there's a limit assessment of what people do actually understand in the process of informed consent. And finally, we know we have serious issues with plain language in informed consent documents. So, couple recommendations. We can increase comprehension, and we know some of the ways to do this. We can assess if they understand it in a more direct sense. That should be a standard practice, not if some people do it, some people don't. But the other thing that, and this goes really to Dr. Goldkind's uh, um, presentation earlier, is this is, and our team firmly believes, that the informed consent, the recruitment informed consent process is the beginning of a relationship. And if we begin that relationship in a way that fosters trust and understanding and dialogue, we believe that that will ultimately play out in a successful completion of that research subject. So increasing satisfaction will help us to build that trust at the beginning. So we really began thinking, and we've taken two tacks to this, in our Building Trust Research Infrastructure Initiative grant, we did three data collection arms. They said it was a grand opportunity, and we were pretty grandiose when we wrote this proposal. It had five specific aims. What was I thinking? Um, but what we did was this. We said, we are not just going to document the problem. We want to do something to address the problem. So we did our data collection. Then we have created three curriculums. Two were really in the final finishing touches on the facilitator's guide. And, and one is for researchers and research staff. How do you recruit? How do you address the history of race and, and distrust and research abuses? How do you address issues that are more complex? Even when we adhere to the guidelines, even when we do everything right, things like the Kennedy-Krieger case emerge, things like the Havasupai case emerge. So how do we think about complicated ethics? How do we recruit? How do we have critical conversations in our own research teams about race and ethnicity and recruitment? 
How do we retain people? How do we build community partnerships? That's the researcher curriculum. Then we have one that researchers and community organizations can use with their community members on what is research? Why would you participate? Why does it make a difference? Why is it important in the context of health disparities? What I'm going to show you now is a little bit from the web-based version of that. This is Building Trust. It's a resource for researchers and community partners. Oops, I didn't mean it to do that. Oh, it did something I wasn't expecting. So um, it's made of three components. The importance of research, why participate in research? How is it important? What do you, you know, what, what um, is the relevance of research in, in, the issue, in terms of dealing with health disparities? The second is informed decision making. I'll talk about that more in a moment. And the third is research, community, and you. How can community members be involved with researchers? I'm going to try to click this and hope it doesn't take me to the video, because I don't want us to go to the video. Ah. Ay, 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 ay. OK. All right, I'm going to have to do something. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to have to click out of this for a moment in order to change sides, clearly. So each of these has in it video, audio, didactic material, questions for discussion, and resources. Resources you can download, you can take with you, OK? So bear with me a second. Ah. <laughs> From current slide. Okay. Ah, what am I doing? It keeps taking me back to that slide for some reason. So let me talk you through what I, I'm trying to show you. Okay, we're where we need to be. The, the informed decision making, what we're saying is that it's time for a broader educational component about informed consent. That doesn't await until the person arrives in your, in your clinic, ready to potentially participate in the study, but really helps them to understand it. And so in the informed decision making process, we have a myths and facts. We have a learning from the past where we talk about some of the abuses of the past because we can't pretend they didn't happen. We talk about what the protections are today. And on each of those, you click on it, it tells you what an IRB is. It tells you what the different components are. And then, should I participate? What is informed consent? Aha. So here we have the myths and facts. You can see some of those. When they click over there, they get the facts or the myths. We have what is informed consent, and we begin to talk about it, including having a video. And we also have key elements of the informed consent process, and they can look and understand, and there's a, another document that explains what those are. And then we take three real informed consents, and we identify where those elements are in the informed consent. Okay, this happens to be one of mine for one of my studies. And so they can refer back to what those key elements are and see it in, an, in three different kinds. One's a clinical trial. This is a, um, more of a social and behavioral science study. They also can have a, 10 key questions to ask a researcher. And they can take these key elements of informed consent, the 10 key questions, and literally download those as PDFs and take them with them so that it's a tool. We also have research terms to know. So we have a glossary here as well 
that they can take with them if they'd like to. And each concludes with a few final thoughts. So we really believe there's a, a, a several prong process. There's a broader educational effort that's important. And then there is the specific components of improving informed consent when somebody comes in to talk about participation. And that those are critical to building trust and to creating a more educated participant. Thank you. <laughs>